It will be devoted to contributions of basic sciences to education for human security. The first speaker is Andrew Halley. She is uh, the Vice Provost and Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences of the Aga Khan University in Pakistan, Karachi. He is also the Vice President of the International Commission of Mathematical Instruction. Her talk will be devoted to holistic education for human security. Anjum, please. Thank you, uh, Nibajosa. Good day. It's my great pleasure to be speaking at this significant international educational gathering, which is looking at the future of education for human security. As I have noted in my abstract, that the world today is facing many challenges and it's an increasingly complex and fast changing world. Some of the challenges include climate change, conflict, um, displacement, demo fast demographic change, just to name a few. And in such a context, what kind of education can prepare the youth? It will have to be an education that is not premised on a narrow accumulation of knowledge. But I note that in many low-income and middle-income countries, particularly post in post-colonial context, of course, in some high-income countries too, but most of the low and middle income countries where I have had the experience of teaching. Education systems, the basic school education systems stream the students into narrow specializations very early on in their education. So for example, the education systems in, the, in South Asia, in the Indian subcontinent or in East Africa, Students decide are asked to choose whether they would go for a science stream or a commerce stream or an art stream as early as elementary school. In addition to the uh, early streaming, there is a much greater emphasis placed on STEM education. In fact, the, pub, the, the, edu the public education system incentivizes stress, investment in STEM in many different ways. As a consequence of this early streaming, a student, for example, um, a, um, a student in natural sciences, for example, will go on to her undergraduate and postgraduate education with little or no understanding of how philosophy, literature, arts, and humanities shape the world. And this is a big issue. Fareed Zakaria, a well-known media personality in the US and author of the of, of quite a well-known text in defense of a liberal education, got his education in India with similar constraints of a very early and narrow specialization imposed upon the students. In his book, he describes and notes the role of uh, liberal arts education, interdisciplinary education as such, and I quote from his text, liberal arts subjects such as English, philosophy and political science teach people how to think, write and communicate. Those skills remain useful through, through the many twists and turns of a career in today's ever-changing digital economy. It is dangerous to overemphasize STEM education as a separate from or more important than the liberal arts. Rather than pitting the liberal arts uh, against STEM, there should be more cross-pollination between the two groups creativity and innovation occur when disciplines cross path. So when disciplines cross path, education becomes cross-disciplinary, much more creativity and innovation occurs. That's his thesis. And uh, if, in, in this way, uh, Farid Zakaria is promoting the notion of an education that is not very narrow, but it's much more broader and holistic. From a slightly different perspective, UNESCO's latest publication, a toolkit named Mathematics for Action, which was published um, last year at the International Day of Mathematics, draws the attention for a need, again, for a cross-disciplinary perspective to look at the problems facing the humanity. 
This tool kit showcases well the role of mathematics in decision making, where a growing range of mathematical models are enabling us to analyze the extent to which natural phenomena, many of which I noted, or those that humans have generated themselves will affect how we live and how we sustain in this increasingly fragile environment. So in from, um, for example, about this need to take a cross-disciplinary perspective to problem solving, we look at how traditionally so social scientists would employ household surveys to map out poverty and socioeconomic status. But we also note that carrying out household surveys is very expensive, and often the data in many low-income countries when the data is outdated or reliable data is not available. In this UNESCO publication that I refer to, Mathematics for Action, they present the case study from Senegal, use of big data to improve poverty mapping in Senegal. And they note that to fill in the gaps, such gaps, for, for example, uh, that traditional methodology, the traditional social science methodology of household surveys leaves, non-traditional data sources were used as proxies, applying mathematical tools like machine learning algorithms to combine cell phone records, satellite image, uh, imagery, GIS data, and social media connectivity, traditional poverty data were supplemented to build microestimates of wealth and poverty. By increasing the granularity, by increasing the gran granularity of poverty estimates, decision makers could thus assess regional variations in poverty and growth. This allowed for more effective targeting and prioritizing of policy interventions and resources based on local decisions, uh, local conditions. So uh, this uh, UNESCO's toolkit on mathematics draws attention for the need for public policies to be based on evidence which is increasingly uh, taken uh, from tools which draw from multiple uh, disciplinary perspectives. So if in I gave you the example of social sciences, scientists who usually used to use tra traditional surveys, but now they are using mathematical modeling uh, using AI and big data. And the toolkit, of course, presents many, many more examples of how mathematics helps us look at mathematical modeling, helps us in looking at problems, social problems, uh, natural, uh, natural phenomenon related problems in a holistic multidisciplinary manner. The question arises that how do you engender among the youth and among the scientists a perspective that breaks the silos which creates if you specialize too narrowly too soon. It, the presentation that I have made um, is the key point that I, want, uh, I, I note from here is that disciplinary specialization notwithstanding, higher education must prepare youth through a rigorous multidisciplinary core curriculum before they specialize. The holistic education would prepare them the youth to look for tools from different fields and disciplines in order to address large social problems and in turn contribute to a world which is more secure and a sustainable world. So that is my thesis about a holistic education for human security. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for the talk and for being uh, within the time limit. So we will come back to you. Uh, with some questions in the discussion. The I next... look forward to that. Thank you. Very good. Uh, the next speaker is Alexander Zidonshek. He comes from the Jozef Stefan International Postgraduate School and the Jozef Stefan Institute in Ljubljana, Slovenia. He is a professor there. He also teaches at the Faculty of Natural Sciences and Mathematics of the University of Maribor, also in Slovenia. Besides, he is a trustee of the World Academy of Art and Science. He is a physicist and he'll talk about contributions of physics to education for human security. Sandy, please. Uh, many thanks, dear Nebosha, for this kind of introduction and also for the invitation and organization of this wonderful roundtable. And uh, as uh, 
the first point my first point is that physics is a little different than other sciences so i will emphasize this in my contribution uh, my second point is that i'm trying to get rid of my addiction to powerpoint but i still prepare the short powerpoint because it might be easier uh, to follow uh, so uh, so the idea is that uh, uh, and uh, how the species contributes uh, to both human security and education for human security. And uh, the story basically is that physics has been changing since the ancient times when uh, Aristotle wrote a book entitled Physics. Uh, but then we had a lot of progress until Einstein actually put, turned the physics upside down, which means that now instead of uh, believing what Aristotle knew or what Newton knew, we know that uh, the truth is a little different. And we also know that we still don't know the whole truth, which means that physics is still being developed. So this is Aristotle in the picture. And as such basic natural science, uh, the develop this development of physics actually changes the narrative in the society and also the worldview in society. Our worldview is different than it was in the Middle Ages or in the ancient times. And it will evolve still because physics hasn't finished yet. So the biggest inventions in physics are still ahead of us. Uh, so we are talking about the understanding of the world on one hand, and also the foundation of modern technologies on the other hand. And these new modern technologies, you know, are also affecting physics because they are allowing us to develop new physics. So it's like a, a never ending cycle of innovation, development and improvement. Uh, so we talked about physics, uh, is it useful or are we just teaching it because there are five, six theoretical physicists in the world? So one big issue is energy technology that are extremely important for the security in the contemporary world, particularly about uh, the, the climate change and uh, the issues that are affecting our environment. And here, new energy technologies like solar photovoltaics or fusion uh, or other technologies can contribute really greatly. Uh, and also this contributes to the reduction of pollution, which is really very important in contemporary world, and also to human health, you know, as we are getting older and older, uh, we, each of us personally, but also the human civilization, the average age is going up, the health is getting more and more important, and here it's a combination of physics, biology, medicine, and other disciplines that can really contribute greatly, and I will not keep counting, but I will move to this safe communities and personal safety, uh, which are really getting more important lately. One would imagine that 21st century, it would be violence free, but it's just the opposite. So that's why uh, in creation uh, of peace uh, between the nations and uh, within communities is extremely important. And also human rights uh, are something that new technologies that have been developed with the progress of physics can actually contribute because we are getting more privacy and more control uh, on our lives. And that's how the human rights can actually get stronger. And so these are like the main contributions. But if we talk about physics breakthroughs, you know, we all remember Galileo Galilei and Isaac Newton uh, at the end of like the Middle Ages. Uh, basically part of the reason Middle Ages ended was also the invention of the real physics, uh, which was then holding for 200 years. Uh, Galileo is here. And then Faraday and Maxwell discovered something new about electricity. And it was thermodynamics and statistical physics. So, uh, But then in 1900, you know, 1900, uh, people used to say, the best physicists would say, everything has been invented. We are just going to measure natural constant. Uh, even this patent office can be closed because everything has been invented. And then what happened? There were like just two small problems in physics. And from one of those two small problems, quantum physics originated from the other one, relativity. And Einstein is very famous for that. And those two uh, theories, quantum and quantum physics and relativity, actually uh, contributed to the origin of ICT revolution of new computers, which are changing the, the world that we live in today. Uh, I mean, somebody from 100 years ago would not recognize today's world. So the world has changed so much, but mainly because of these two theories, which originated from two small problems in physics. Everything else was solved. There were two small problems that were not solved. And then there was a curious um, physicist sitting in the patent office in Zurich who didn't have much work to do, and he invented relativity. So, so that's basically how the progress is made. And we expect that this is how the progress will continue to be made. Uh, so yes, what's next? Uh, one hand is technological progress and smart machines. We are talking about uh, this Moore law in uh, 
information uh, technologies development when every two years approximately every two years the speed of technologies doubles and this doubling of speed of technologies allows physicists to use faster and better computers and to develop new physics which then in addition uh, continues with this cycle so uh, there is really um, new knowledge and new information being created faster than ever in history of humankind and uh, what is ahead of us uh, one big issue is this quantum computing technology which is being created i mean uh, it's 40 years old but it's still not uh, for practical application but uh, it is coming very close which means that it will allow the computers to be even faster and to tackle even more difficult challenges and this tackling of difficult challenges by computers actually contributes to our quality of life because it helps us to solve more difficult problems uh, and so this is like a picture of quantum computer quantum communication is a twin of quantum computing which allows for secure communication that cannot be uh, uh, eavesdropped and then of course the next step which is just ahead the corner i mean maybe a few years behind quantum computing, is biological computing where you can store your data in dnas when you can make computers similarly as a natural system so so this is just around the corner and once this appears then probably also new physics will appear we will tackle it. there are like two big problems now in physics uh, you know uh, and uh, how to bring this quantum physical relativity together and there are two approaches one is this large collaborations like for example CERN or other international collaboration where you put more and more money inside and you gain higher and higher energies and you get more and more knowledge out of the nature and uh, then there is another possibility to use like smarter ways uh, to do calculations for example everybody knew it's impossible to calculate the structure of the protein but then google created this alpha fold uh, neural network which told this and it seems easy now uh, four years ago it was impossible which means either you put a lot of money and a lot of smart people in a small place and then you create new knowledge out of that uh, or you get find smart people who use new approaches and then you create new knowledge also in this way and i think both these ways are necessary so this is like a structure that was created by this alpha fold google neural network and if you talk about this old physics how it supports peace you know fusion has been developed for 20 30 years now and it still needs a few decades to be developed but it's a great contribution to peace because it will create energy independence for humanity solar power is something that is going more slowly but steadily and it is already an important part of our energy uh, and uh, then defense systems are actually strange systems but they are preventing people to attack you which means they also in, in, a, in a way contribute to peace uh, we can uh, look at this history you can see as physics was evolving also the share of democracies was improving which means that uh, i know this was not directly correlated but this is a similar uh, development uh, which can also be seen observed in the reduction of the conflicts you know these are a number of deaths from military conflicts which has been going down in the past 70 years significantly uh, and then how would new physics support peace i think actually two different uh, uh, ideas which are really great and they can help us this is mainly about bringing together quantum physics and relativity and uh, this will bring us to the understanding of quantum gravity and many people believe this will also bring us to better understanding of human consciousness which can then also help us to live be in better harmony among each other there are eight billion of us there will be 10 billion soon and we need to figure out better ways to living together if you want to eliminate those troubles and gain new knowledge new wealth and get more security for the humans so this road ahead i believe is mainly the education how to get there on one hand we decide, uh, discover new physics on the other hand we share this education with other people so one issue we, uh, is this european esco ecosystem where they put together all the skills and competencies uh, and professions and how to link them together so that people have more skills and better application of the skills we did our uh, own application which kind of 
follow the time development of the competencies of an individual person or a company. And uh, here, I would just like to uh, end with acknowledgement to people who have helped me a lot. You know, we are all standing on the shoulders of giants. Uh, I, I was lucky to, to have met two of those. Professor Robert Bims was my supervisor. Uh, Professor Ivo Schlaus is the honorary president of World Academy, and he has been a great inspiration. And I believe that if we follow this path of the people who inspired us, develop new physics and share this knowledge among the broad number of people, then we are on good paths and the future is going to be really bright. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Alexander. Thank you also for mentioning Ivo Schlaus. He was uh, the president of the World Academy of Art and Science in the previous period, but he is still active and I hope He's, uh, he's listening uh, to this uh, session. Anyway, I'll come back to you in the, in the discussion. You know about that. Now, let us move on. And I'm asking Sonia Jovanovic from the Laboratory of Physics of the Vinci Institute of Nuclear Sciences in Belgrade, Serbia, to give a contribution. It uh, will be devoted to chemistry for sustainable development and human well-being. She is a physical chemist. Sonia, please. Thank you, Nebuša, for kind introduction and for giving me opportunity to, to be a panelist at uh, this uh, very important uh, conference. So now I will share uh, my screen with you, with my presentation. So um, at uh, the beginning of my presentation, I uh, want to make a link uh, between uh, language uh, and uh, chemistry. So the humans are uh, unique uh, since uh, they have um, left the trail of their past. So by using the pictures and the figurines, uh, sculptures, uh, taking a snapshot of uh, their surrounding and the uh, way of living, so this was followed by encryptions uh, that uh, enabled uh, transfer of information. So this is an ongoing uh, process of uh, change uh, taking place uh, over millennia. So as a result, we have alphabet uh, array of letters that are the building blocks of language in uh, writing. So the humans uh, have uh, created an alphabet to systemize uh, something uh, they were already using uh, on everyday uh, basis. So uh, the story um, of chemistry actually is uh, similar. So as the um, case of language in writing, the, uh, the humans uh, have been using uh, chemistry without uh, knowing it. Uh, in my opinion, this can be linked uh, to the ancient times when first uh, chemistry-based uh, processing technologies were uh, established. So in fact, uh, we have certain eras in human uh, history like Bronze Age and the Iron Age that uh, were based on uh, chemical elements. So in the case of Bronze Age, we have copper, we have tin, nickel, uh, aluminium. In iron, we have uh, iron elements itself. So current era of uh, digital uh, um, evolution uh, is in fact also based on um, elements such as gold, gallium, carbon, that are building blocks of uh, semiconductors and uh, modern electronics. Uh, there are um, a strong uh, indication, uh, indication that uh, carbon as graphene will play uh, an important role in uh, future electronics. So as the letters are the building blocks of words, uh, the elements are building blocks uh, of uh, compounds. Uh, at the first discovery of uh, elements originated from surroundings, from uh, earth crust or uh, from the air. So with uh, time, we uh, become able to uh, create uh, elements. So it uh, took a lot of curiosity, creativity, courage and perseverance of researchers uh, in the past 300 years to be able to create elements. So with the fusion and fusion, new el elements um, were discovered, a uh, couple of them in uh, recent years, thus uh, 
expanding the alphabet of uh, chemistry and giving uh, us uh, new opportunities. So the chemistry managed to be sustainable um, uh, thanks to the usefulness of its results. So the recent um, socioeconomic research uh, has shown that uh, subjective well-being uh, is uh, closely related to the sustainable development goals or SDGs. So this uh, relation is uh, quadratic uh, and uh, tells uh, us uh, that as countries improve their sustainability, the subjective well-being improves. So the pie chart actually is showing uh, that sustainable development goals grouped in several categories have different contribution to the subjective well-being. So health, uh, uh, economic uh, and the social aspects contribute the most. But to my surprise, I would expect a larger share of environmental aspects. So uh, uh, there are actually the 17 SDGs defined by United uh, Nation Charter. And here uh, the check mark uh, rec represents my view uh, where the chemistry has a direct role. So for example, in the case of zero hunger, uh, hunger sorry, uh, chemistry is helping through chemicals for agriculture. Uh, in the case of good health and well-being, we have medicaments. Then in the case of, for instance, sustainable cities and communities, uh, chemistry is helping through um, air and water quality monitoring. So uh, how the solutions of the past uh, become challenges of the future. So we can link population-wide reach of chemistry to industrial revolution and uh, to the production of oil and natural gas. So petrochemicals derived from natural gas, uh, gas are uh, being used in uh, production of over 6,000 everyday products. So um, development of plastics has uh, started um, in the second half of the 19th century. Its use has drastically expanded um, after the uh, Second World War, and it is most uh, used material on global scale, and uh, as such, it has a tremendous impact on our well-being. However, um, some applications of plastics are not rational, as you can see on these two uh, photos, especially if we have in mind post-use handling. And uh, here uh, you can see a couple of photos that illustrate the um, global impact of plastics, fossil fuels, and the chemistry in, in general. So the aftermath is of uh, irresponsible use uh, is taking a toll. Um, hence, the solutions of the past have become the challenges of the future. And the chemist, uh, uh, chemistry should recycle its past for increased human security in the future. So Institute of Nuclear Sciences, our group is trying to contribute to the health, uh, human well-being throughout research and throughout the development of novel nanomaterials. Uh, for example, magnetic nanomaterials and nanocomposites for cancer and antibacterial treatment, graphene-based uh, uh, sensors for uh, air quality monitoring, supercapacitors and, and uh, water splitting for clean uh, energy storage and production. So by exploiting cell chemistry and the uh, structural properties of graphene oxide, uh, its electrochemical charge storage properties can be improved. So, and 2D form of graphene oxide allows attachment of various um, nano entities and uh, we have used heteropoly acids and um, their affinity to attach to oxygen and the defects on graphene oxide for preparation of uh, advanced uh, supercapacitors. And we have managed to double the capacity with just small addition of uh, heteropoly acids, just 15 weight percent, and to increase operating voltage and stability of supercapacitors 
in aqueous media. By combining graphene oxide as 2D material with 0D materials, advanced nanocomposite can be designed and their properties can be fur uh, further improved by various energy deposition methods, such as thermal or laser uh, treatment, ion beam irradiation, uh, and uh, ion beam assisted deposition. And this all will enable us to prepare self-sustainable gas sensing system that will be used to air quality monitoring in urban areas. So in conclusion, I will tell you how I see the uh, future of chemistry and education. First, chemistry should recycle its past for increased human security in the future. This means that uh, we should solve problems uh, appearing from previous action and from previous um, solutions. The second, uh, for the progress in organizing education and research in chemistry, we will see an increased role of multi, inter and transdisciplinarity. We will witness an increased contribution of facilitating knowledge acquisition uh, uh, and its role uh, in creating innovative solutions in chemistry. And the third, and in my opinion, the most important, ethics. So besides considering scientific uh, and or economic cost to benefit uh, aspects, it, uh, it's become uh, mandatory to include social, uh, societal, sorry, point of view to uh, activities in chemistry. Hence, chemists should be increasingly for knowing of possible negative outcomes of their activities, and this awareness, uh, awareness is taught. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very, very much, uh, Sonia. Thank you uh, also for a number of concrete uh, examples about uh, the applications of chemistry uh, important for human security. Let us uh, move on. Uh, the next speaker is Alexander Bugai. He is the director of the Laboratory of Radiation Biology of the Joint Institute for Nuclear Research in Dubna, Russia. His talk will be devoted to basic sciences and global security threats and will be focused on education in radiation biology and genome research. Alexander, please. Thank you very much, Neibosha, for your kind invitation and participation in such a wonderful event. My speech will, would be mostly focused on the biology as a basic science. So there are a lot of global risks and threats. A lot of them were already mentioned. I mean, environmental problems, pollutions, also health problems connected with global pandemics, diseases, cancer, brain disorders, and so on. Also nuclear standoff and increasing probability of global wars, terrorism, financial problems and increasing social inequality. Also, a lot of impact of digital security now comes into our lives. So the problems are almost clear for everyone, but I would like to focus on the new, new threat for the humanity, which originated almost about 100 years or so. This is the radiation. Of course, there are both positive and negative sides from the radiation. Positive ones, I hope, overwhelm negative ones. So we have a lot of nuclear power stations around the world. Also, different radiation technologies contribute a lot to our lives and well being. I mean, mostly diagnostic and radiation therapy of cancer and other applications in 
production of medical isotopes and so on. Also, radiation may be a barrier for the active space exploration and space programs, and we need to consider this problem too. And of course, there are a lot of problems connected with nuclear wastes and nuclear weapons. We have to do nothing with this, but still there are political and societal movements who tries to avoid all these problems by just avoiding the radiation and radiation technologies at all. And how the young people, students, can encounter all these problems and how they can interact with the increasing usage of radiations in our world. So we need to establish a proper model of education, which helps everyone to find out what is the radiation and how it influences our life. So this is the typical educational model which we use in our institute, university center. And what is the basics? The basics actually relies on three main basic sciences, biology, physics, and chemistry. And as you can see from this sketch, there are a lot of contributions between different basic sciences covering medical applications like radiation therapy of cancer, diagnostics, radiation protections. Also, we need to mention very fundamental research connected with molecular biology, genetics, also with astrobiology, search of the life in space. So also there are complementary fields connected with mathematics, mathematics and computation, mainly usage of artificial intelligence in our research. And also the problems connected with nuclear waste are deeply connected with ecology and of course with epidemiological studies of the human population connected in different ways with natural or technogenical radiation sources. So I would like to start a brief overview of all those fields, how it can be used in organization of student educations. The first one is nuclear physics and complementing engineering studies. Of course, the students need to know the basics of the radiation origins, particle interactions, quantum mechanics, quantum field theory. These are very basic knowledge, but still there are a lot of technical knowledge that need, which need to be implemented in the educational process, like the problems of radiation sources, construction of specific equipment, their efficient applications in medicine and other fields like cyclotrons and other type of accelerators, nuclear reactors, also the instruments for the symmetry of different kinds of radiations and also the, some instruments even for the space research. When we are going to the action of radiations on the living cells and living organisms, we need to first distinguish different steps of or stages how radiation interacts with living matter. Of course, the first and the most basic and fundamental stages are physical and chemical. And this is where the physical part of education sense. So the basics of this damage is connected mostly to the different lesions in the human and animal genomes. We may encounter base damage, single or double strand breaks of the DNA, and all those damage can be carefully studied from the basic physical and chemical events. And now we need to go further and use the instruments from the molecular biology and genetics, or more generally the omics 
it's in general implementing more more different protocols like proteomics, metabolomics, etc. So the basic thing here is the same. Radiation damage the DNA and or other cell organelles, and we need to establish the number, the quality of this damage, try to find the ways how it can be repaired by the cells, and most importantly, genetic apparatus will react after the radiation incident or cancer treatment. So this is the most fundamental part and is deeply connected with the novel gen genetic technologies. As you know, the so-called CRISPR and Cas9 genome editing systems are rely on the production of short double strand breaks. And as we know in our field, radiation biology, the genome will be repaired in one or two ways. One way is error-free and can be successfully used for the genetic modification. But another way is error-prone and can disrupt the genetic information, not only the insertion, but it can be somewhat stochastic process. And in result, even if we put such incorrect information in the different cells, we may get genomic instability. And there are a lot of ways how it can react. Probably we will get cancer or something even worse. So this is the other coin side of the new modern technologies, which will allow our modern mod medicine to treat previously worse genetic and other disorders. So this is it. Another field of basic biology, physiology is closely connected to the organismal effects of radiations. And here we come to the important problems connected with bioethics. The students need to know that animals must be taken carefully. They cannot be sacrificed most times. And for this, we also need different, mostly physical technologies. Like here, you can see a contactless EEG record system to use the brain to study the brain activity during the ex experiment after the irradiation. Of course, this research is strongly connected with neuroscience. And in our radiation biology, neuroscience is mostly connected to the, the risk of the space radiation because astronauts may encounter very strong cosmic rays, which may impact on their performance and normal cognitive abilities. So this is the real problems for the space agencies and this need to be solved in the laboratories. So this is it. And another closely connected field is the usage of the so-called artificial intelligence or artificial neural network in the research process. On the other side, we study real brain, but still we can use artificial systems to simulate each behavior and, for example, use it in our research to simplify the work of the researcher. For example, we can use artificial video tracking system to study the animal behavior. The next step is the applications in medicine. Here you can see a sample of the imitation system for the radiation therapy. Our students can participate in the diagnostics and planning of therapy on animal models can produce irradiation of transplanted tumors and then proceed with the evaluation of obtained results. The final goal, of course, is to deliver radiation as to the mostly tumor-located parts 
and to obtain as much biological efficiency as possible. And finally, the field related with chemistry and even this very fundamental space research connected with search of life in space. We can study traces of living organisms in meteorites or even try to reproduce the prebiotic synthesis pathways which may encounter in space conditions from very simple organic molecules located on meteorites, comets, on other bodies of our solar system. So this is it, which we can use with our radiation facilities. And finalizing, I would like to focus that implementation of such a multidisciplinary research is very complex, but still we need to enhance our field in efforts to contribute to human well-being and security. And I would like very much to cite the Malcolm X, which says, education is the passport to the future. Tomorrow belongs to those who prepare for it today. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Alexander, for a rich talk with a number of uh, pieces of information for radiation biology. Let us move on, and uh, I am inviting Hu Chen to, to, to deliver his talk. Distinguished colleagues and Reuters scholars, it is an honor to have the opportunity to deliver this course on the subject of, contrib of chemistry. Uh, contrib contribution to basic science to education for human security connected to talent cultivation. It is my utmost pleasure to address a topic uh, of such paramount importance to our society, as it holds the key to un unlocking our potential uh, and building a safer and more secure world for generations to come. Human uh, security, as we all know, it is a multifaceted concept that encompasses diverse aspects of our lives, including but not limited to health, financial stability, and environmental sustainability. Nevertheless, nevertheless, the threats to human security have become increasingly intricate and interlinked, posing formidable challenges to ensuring that individuals can lead secure, healthy, and prosperous lives. In recent times, a strong collaboration has been established between the development of talent and the uh, advancement of human security. This presentation seeks to elucidate the significance of cultivating talent in basic science in propelling human security forward. Let us start with introducing the concept of human security, which involves protecting individuals, communities from harm, ensuring their ability to live with dignity and pursue their goals free from fear and wants. Human security is a human right. It refers to the security of people and the communities. Human security is a multi-dimensional concept that uh, uh, includes protection from e economical, social, political, and uh, environmental threats. Homeland security is a concept that has emerged the, in response to various threats to people's lives and uh, livelihoods. Talent cultivation allows us to nurture uh, the potential for innovation and the prosperity that serves as the crux of genuine human security. The cultivation of talents that can contribute to human security is of utmost importance. However, the challenges to human security are multifaceted and encompass a broad spectrum uh, of issues. The scope of these challenges ranges from uh, environmental degradation and the climate change to conflict and the terrorism, poverty and the in, um, inequality and or to disease and the epidemics, among others. 
these challenges are contingent on geographical locations and can have a direct and indirect impacts on the physical, economic, and the social welfare of humanity. Human security in, uh, faces numerous and diverse challenges that are con uh, contingent on geographic location. Among the most uh, prominent ones are health-related issues that include infectious disease and ailments, financial instability such as economic research, environmental concern like uh, climate change. The impact of these are the, uh, and that is it's global and detrimental to human welfare. Moreover, these challenges pose a formidable obstruction to the attainment of human security. One of the primary underlying cause of these threats is the convergence, convergence of unsustainable lifestyles and poverty, which has led to a marked deterioration in human security. The inability of individuals and the communities uh, to access necessary necessities such as sustenance, potable water, and uh, hygienic facilities has resulted in severe health consequences and reduced the opportunities for well being. And the uh, unsustainable lifestyles and the poverty are among the significant obstacles to achieving human security. Unsustainable lifestyles lead to environmental degradation, resource depletion, and uh, biodiversity loss. Poverty affects people's access to basic by un undermining their well being and uh, contributing to insecurity. The coexistence of unsustainable lifestyles and poverty exhibits the stress to human security by creating a vicious cycle of environmental degradation, resource depletion, and the social inequality. Capitalistic development refers is a, a multi-unit process that plays a crucial role. In Let me now proceed with the second part of the session, uh, the discussion, and uh, I'll have, uh, I'll put the questions to, to each of you. And let me start with uh, Anju. Uh, your approach to education, the human security is holistic. We have heard that. This means, among other things, that it is necessary to include in education at all levels the achievements of basic sciences, as well as of social and humanistic sciences. Of course, in certain proportions, depending on the main direction of study. The question is, is there a university in Pakistan, the UK, or somewhere else at which such an approach has been adopted and is applied? This is a question for you, Anjum. Please. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is a very important question, and thank you for posing it. I'll just give a, a first a brief preliminary comment and then come to the specific of your question. So a holistic education, which draws on multiple disciplines, which is cross-disciplinary in nature, is not a new concept. If we look at the education systems in the Islamic world, for example, in the centers of education in Cairo, their ancient uh, university called Jamia al-Azhar, or Baghdad, or in the ancient Greece, for example, the structure of education was not focused on narrow disciplinary disciplines as, um, as the focus of education, but it emphasized development of mental, mental attributes such as higher order thinking, debate, writing, and so on. In the contemporary world, this approach, uh, a modified form of this approach, is what is known popularly as the American liberal arts, which is about foundational preparation for life impact, and including uh, like ways of thinking and understanding of the span of human knowledge. I mean, if you look at the, look at this um, text by uh, 
what do you call it, Richard Deitweiler, the evidence liberal art needs, it's, it's, it explains uh, this kind of a structure of knowledge. Now, coming to your specific question, is there a program, such a program of undergraduate education in, a, in Pakistan, for example? So my answer would be yes. The Aga Khan University, where I am um, teaching currently and where I am the vice provost, has just launched such a program of studies of a four-year undergraduate program where the first two years cover a core curriculum. And the core curriculum encourages breadth, providing students opportunity to integrate knowledge from across a broad range of fields and disciplines in the humanities, and natural sciences and social sciences. So all students have to take their core curriculum for the first and the second year. And then the final two years are for specializations in the field of their choice. In the final two years of the undergraduate program, they will engage in intensive, concentrated, specialized training. So that um, uh, is my response to your question. The historical trajectory of this approach and its current manifestation. I hope I addressed your question, Nibbles. Thank you very much. I wanted to hear just that, that there is such a school in Pakistan. It is wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. The second question to you is, why it is important, for example, for a student of philosophy to acquire in parallel uh, uh, with the, with the main direction of study, some mathematical knowledge. Why is this important, please? Oh, this is a beautiful question. So I would say mathematics and philosophy have a lot in common. Philosophy trains the mind to ask questions. Philosophy promotes analytical thinking and to question um, assumptions which may have been given a priori assumptions. And this, uh, you know, um, enhances the ability to analyze issues, um, communicate complex ideas clearly. And when you come to mathematics, what is the hallmark of mathematics? Conjecture, proof, reasoning, all of these are all, they also train the mind in particular ways of thinking. And it trains your mind for higher order thinking. Logic, which is an important branch of an, or an important element in the study of mathematics, is also an important component in the study of philosophy. So I cannot imagine that somebody who is studying philosophy would have no interaction with mathematics. In fact, that will leave the field of philosophy somewhat depleted. And when you are studying mathematics, you are obviously employing the tools of thinking and rigor, which are also the foundations of philosophy. So the two are highly integrated and contribute to the development of each other. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Uh, uh, let us now move to Sonia. Uh, you have mentioned plastic microparticles in the environment. How does their presence affect human health? And how should education and training help in fighting against microplastics? Please. Uh, thank you for for a very interesting question. So yes, I mentioned uh, in my presentation a problem with uh, with uh, plastic. So first, um, um, yes, microplastics. Uh, we can actually divide it uh, into two main categories. Um, according to the uh, their source. So we have a primary microplastics, which uh, actually is the, the microplastics uh, directly released in environment. And uh, it is estimated that uh, uh, the primary microplastics represents around 30% of all microplastics in the ocean. And uh, the main sources of this kind of microplastics are the textile industry, it's uh, uh, around 35% of primary micro microplastics. Uh, also, 28% um, uh, of uh, primary microplastics actually 
raised from abrasion of tires throughout uh, driving. And uh, for me, it was most shocking the, the information that 2% of microplastics, um, uh, primary microplastics is actually intentionally added uh, microplastics in personal care products. So in a scrub cream, facial creams. Um, and um, the secondary uh, uh, plastics uh, actually originated from the degradation of larger plastic objects such as uh, plastic bottles or or bags or or fishing nests and uh, the um, uh, seventy percent of all microplastics actually belongs to this secondary microplastics group. So um, microplastics in the yeah. I, as I mentioned, it can be found in a in a sea, and it can be ingested by the um, uh, marine animals, and uh, uh, at the, the end can uh, uh, ended in in the humans throughout the food chain. Uh, also, um, uh, microplastic uh, mi microplastic has um, have been found in uh, in food and the drinks, including beer, honey, and uh, tap water. So not surprisingly, um, plastics uh, also um, have um, recently discovered uh, in human placenta. So the extent of negative effects uh, of um, uh, to uh, effects to human health uh, is uh, still unknown, but uh, it may be enhanced by uh, additives and other toxic um, uh, chemicals uh, within plastics. Uh, and these uh, chemicals and additives can um, uh, be harmful um, to to the animals and the, and the humans. And uh, actually, what we can do uh, here, uh, we should uh, educate a generation of chemists uh, that will favorize eco-friendly solutions, aware of societal consequences of their actions. So, actually, this is the answer of your question. Thank you. Uh, you have also mentioned the, ne the necessity to organize research and education in chemistry for human security as a multiple disciplinary way, in a multidisciplinary way. Which links of chemistry with other basic and applied sciences has proven the most successful in enriching education for human security so far? Oh, uh, yeah, but, uh, so uh, the links uh, between basic sciences, between chemistry, physics, mathematics, and biology um, were traditional routes uh, for enriching the education for human security so far. And the examples of these links actually are uh, material science, uh, pharmacy, uh, computational chemistry, and others. Uh, and in the future, links between chemistry uh, and uh, uh, informatics uh, or uh, uh, social sciences may prove uh, more important for uh, enriching the education for, for, for human security. And um, examples um, are um, actually the virtu uh, virtual sorry, laboratories uh, uh, interactive. Uh, the digital simulations of uh, activities uh, that uh, typically take place in, in physical laboratory settings. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sonia. Let us now Thank move you. Alexander. As you have pointed out, radiation biology is uh, a typical multiple disciplinary science whose results can significantly contribute to increasing human security. Can you very briefly present your concept of integrated research and education in this particular field focused on human health? Very briefly, please, Alexander. Okay, thank you. As I pointed out in my report, actually the general concept is based on three basic sciences as a triangle with angles in biology, physics, and chemistry. But of course, it contributes in many fields of human security, radiation protection, human health, and so on. In 
if we focus on human health, then the main concept is centered on the medical physics, the medical accelerators, production of isotopes, biological disciplines from molecular biology to genetics, biodosimetry up to the physiological and oncological disciplines. And finally, if we are speaking about chemistry, we need to mention radio protectors, which can prevent negative feedback of radiation. So this is it. Okay. Thank you. I know that you are a leader of a group doing research of the influence of galactic cosmic rays on the central nervous system of an astronaut during a deep space mission. Can this research be connected in any way to education for human security? How, how would you do that, connect these two things? Indeed, it, it could be somewhat complications at the first glance, but still, if we are speaking about human security, of course, the safety and health of astronauts is in doubt problem. And of course, we need to combine our education and radiation biology with basics of space medicine and space research. This is one point. And another point, probably related to the future of the humanity, if we want to travel far and explore far space, we need to think about different obstacles. And the radiation is one is one of the main obstacles. And thinking about that, we need to produce new knowledge and produce new educational programs. So this is the only way how we could go far in this space. But this is my you, opinion. If we want to inhabit Mars, we have to think about humans <laughs> being, staying healthy there. <laughs> OK, thank you very much. Uh, first question for you. Your, your central point is that in order to achieve the aims of human security, we should introduce in education cultivation of talents for basic sciences. When should we begin with this practice? At which level of education? And what are the educational contents at that initial level? This is the first question to you. Um, thank you for the question. Um, which is very relevant to the main theme of my speech. To achieve the aims of human security, we need to introduce the cultivation of talents for basic science in education. In terms of educational content, I believe that at the elementary school level, the focus should be on providing um, a strong foundation in the natural science, including physics, chemistry, chemistry and biology. By introducing basic concepts and the principles in these fields and giving students opportunities to explore them through hands-on activities and uh, experiments. As students progress to high levels of education, the focus should shift towards more advanced topics and the specialized areas of, of study. For example, at the middle school level, students could be introduced to more comp complex concepts in physics and chemistry. S similarly, at the high school level, students could be offered a more specialized course in specific areas of basic science, such as biology, chemistry, physics, and environmental science to foster scientific reasoning ability that are transferable across the STEAM disciplines. I believe that introducing the cultivation of talents for basic science as early as possible is crucial. And the elementary school is an ideal level to start. By providing a strong foundation in basic science, we can help students develop critical thinking and problem solving skills, which are essential for success in any field. In addition, introducing scientific concepts at an early age can help spark an interest in science and technology, leading to more students pursuing careers in these fields in future.
Overall, I believe that by introducing the cultivation of the talents for basic science in education, we can help students develop essential skills and interests, leading to a more secure and prosperous future. Thank you again for a question. Thank you, Bu. Uh, I know that the Chinese Academy of Sciences has established a postgraduate program that includes uh, the aim to cultivate talents for basic sciences a long time ago. Can you tell us about the essence of carrying out this aim today within that program, postgraduate program? Please. Uh, certainly. Uh, certainly, the Chinese Academy of Science has crafted our postgraduate program with the noble aim of nurturing competent uh, individuals for basic science. The crux of the program, as it stands today, revolves around the creation of young scientists who have acquired extensive knowledge and practical skills in the realm of basic science. The program's blueprint is dedicated to producing scientists who not only excel in their respective fields, but also possess sharp critical thinking skills and can efficiently collaborate and uh, communicate with their colleagues. To attain this objective, the, the program entails an uh, address syllabus that uh, underscores both theoretical and practical training, along with opportunities, opportunities for research and uh, cooperation with world-renowned scientists within the acad academy. Additionally, the program fosters originally and creativity by granting students the liberty to develop their research projects, which may lead to innovative discoveries in their relevant domains. Moreover, the program gave immense weightage to the significance of language proficiency in advancing scientific collaboration and communication on a global scale. On the whole, the bedrock and the foundation of the Chinese Academy of Science development have always been fundamental research. Over the past 70 years, basic science has played a pivotal role in the enriching knowledge and bolstering the country's economy, society, leaving a significant imprint. The essence of executing the objective of breeding skilled personal for basic science within the postgraduate program instilled by CAS today revolves around building young scientists who have a robust fundamental knowledge and practical skills, sharp critical thinking skills, and excellent communication and collaboration skills in the global scientific community. Thank you for the question. I hope that my response is helpful. Thank you, thank you very much, Bu. Let us now move to our last speaker in this session, Alexander. Uh, the first uh, question to you uh, is based on the following. You have mentioned <clears throat> quantum mechanics and theory of relativity as two important breakthroughs in our understanding nature around us and the universe, which happened in the early decades of the 20th century. Besides, one can say that since the end of the Second World War, big science, being science with large-scale facility, has been an important source of new knowledge. We all know that. But it, is also, it has also contributed, big science, to peace all around the world. And I think that the fact, that fact should be promoted through education for human security. Is this done today in today's education, that promotion or explanation of big science? Please. Uh, thank you, Nebojša, for a really interesting question. It's a really important question uh, because if you want to like promote peace around the world, then it's really important to have good collaborations of people from all over 
the world. So, for example, CERN you mentioned is really made a great contribution. Uh, the scientists from really different countries, from different backgrounds, were working together. Perhaps I could add one more example, which is closer to us. It's so called uh, International Center for Theoretical Physics, which is a great example of cooperation between the third world countries and the first world countries. It was like uh, the Nobel Prize was won by uh, Salam, who was a Pakistani physicist. Uh, in, uh, contributing to this invention of electroweak interaction, uh, uh, description of electroweak interaction. And then Italian government gave something in addition. And now today there is a very nice center for theoretical physics, which is beneficial both to the people from Italy, from neighboring countries, from the third world, and they come together and they create new physics. And I believe this is really, really very important. It can contribute to global this year. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander. Uh, we know that curiosity courage, creativity, and persistence are the qualities one must possess to be able to do basic research successfully. Each of these qualities is also necessary to a smaller or larger extent in other human activities. Their development should definitely help us to understand better ourselves and the world around us and thus make us more secure from danger, fear, indignity, and anxiety. The question is, is it possible to create courses at different levels through which these qualities would be systematically cultivated? If yes, can you do this at your school? Please. Okay. Thank you. This is also a very, very, uh, very inspiring question. Particularly, uh, we remember, you know, uh, the progress in the last in the previous century, most of this progress was actually done by that invention of Albert Einstein, who was uh, getting bored in the patent office in Zurich. And uh, his curiosity was uh, the driving force that actually created most of the, a, a large part of modern physics. You know, he should have given like five, six Nobel Prizes for, for only those inventions during that year when he was bored and he was curious. And how do you develop this? Basically, I mentioned earlier this uh, systematic competence development and following of these competences. And this is basically what we are doing. We are also trying to do this in our courses. So we follow which competences are developed, how they are developed. Uh, we also try to measure that. And this is what we are still going to continue to do. And we believe that this is also the way to improve the a contribution of each of the person who in such a way develops uh, the competencies in a better way and if people get more curious more creative then we are going to have better results for the future and uh, this is something we are all doing together thank you thank you alexander uh, let me thank uh, all of you for the participation for a number of uh, new ideas about basic sciences and uh, their contributions to education for human security. Thank you once again and goodbye.